there will be a trustee meeting this Thursday at 6 p.m. I'll say a little bit more about that a little later in the service, but just take note of it if you're a trustee. Um, and, and a council meeting next Sunday after church. Um, otherwise, I am so ready for children's ministry to be back, like right now. Yes. <laughs> uh, we'll get back. It'll be the first week in February, which is right around the corner. So we're gearing up for, for all those things. Um, but right now, trying to stay warm, right? My goodness. Uh, well, let's pray together, and then we'll stand and worship God. Father, we are thankful. We're thankful for this day and all of your grace that has brought us to it. God, we give you all our heart, soul, mind, and strength as we worship this morning as a family of faith. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship God together with when we all get to heaven. To find you in the 
Father, that is the truth, that it is better to be with you in your presence than anywhere else. And yet, Father, our hearts are so often, often wandering in different directions. We can sing those words, but sometimes we don't truly mean them. So, Father, on this morning, we ask for your grace, your guidance, your strength. Father, those places in our hearts that truly long to be in other places than your presence. God, by your grace, show us the truth. Show us the way. Show us the life. That only when we walk in you do we have life. Father, we give ourselves to you. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. And all God's people said, amen. You can be seated. I love both of those songs, the words that they, they have, the, the hope they give, especially stood out to me just now, was uh, just one glimpse of him and glory will the toils of life repay. Uh, that is a beautiful Line And, and uh, am I the only one that looks forward to that day? I know I'm not. I know we are all looking forward to that day. Uh, yeah, Miss Ladner said, hey, right here, I'm looking forward to that day. Um, let's go to the back of the bulletin and look at our, our prayer needs for this week. Prayer needs for this week. Uh, one name that was added is, is Carly. That came over email. Many of you got that. Uh, over the email prayer list. Um, a one-year-old with pneumonia and, and different viruses, we want to be praying, especially for Carly uh, this week. Um, definitely been hard on the, uh, the parents and, of course, on her. So especially want to lift up Carly this week. Um, otherwise, you can see the prayer needs listed there. Um, many of them have been on, on the prayer list uh, last week. And uh, there are other prayer needs also. Um, you know them. I may not know them, but I know you know them, and so we're going to pray as a, 
as a family of faith, first in silent prayer, and then I'll lead us. So let's go to God in prayer. Father, we do look forward to that day when we finally see you face to face. And the truth of that glimpse of you in glory is made known. And all the toils of this life become like nothing. God, we look forward to that day of sharing the victory with you, sharing the victory with our loved ones, sharing the victory with the church triumphant. God, these are our hope. We stand on these promises. Even while we still walk through the toils of life, while, while we walk this pilgrim pathway, clouds overspreading the sky, God, we give all of our trust to you. That even, even as we lift up to you those, those prayer needs, of those difficult days. We also put our faith and full confidence of your promises in Jesus Christ. That God, you are true and faithful. That is where we stand. This morning, we especially pray for Carly, that one-year-old girl, her, her parents as well, her grandparents, her family, the doctors looking after her, that, God, you would give her special strength, that the medicine she's on would be effective, that the doctors looking at multiple different things going on at once would have your wisdom, your insight, your healing hands. We pray for peace over those parents, too, that their peace may be rooted in a confidence in you. Father, you are the true place where all confidence can be anchored. And so in full confidence of your promise, we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. When the ushers come forward for time of offering, and as they come forward, let me tell you our mission moment for today. There's two. Uh, one, you know, I'll draw your attention to the mission spotlight. I talked about uh, these missionaries on our spotlight a little bit last week. But Steve and Lottie Liversedge, they are some of our missions uh, fund uh, missionaries, and they do some great work distributing evangelism resources, uh, mostly in Africa, but um, in, in many different parts of the world. Um, so you can read more about them there. The other thing that I wanted to mention as a mission moment is actually the trustee meeting that's going to be on Thursday. And you might say, what? How is that exactly a mission moment, Pastor Tim? Well, it's quite simple. Uh, we have to update our building use policy as a church if we're going to do good local mission with the We Love All God's Children initiative. Um, and so, you know, some of the things that are coming down the pipeline really soon is us being able to host an AA group in our building, the potential of hosting a homeschool co-op in the building, uh, the potential of uh, uh, many different things that all need updated building use policy. And so, uh, you know, I just love that connection between this trustee meeting on Thursday and local missions because some, some parts don't always get celebrated as mission work. 
But that is very much mission work to make sure all the loose ends are covered here at a local church. So uh, trustees get excited. <laughs> I'm excited about a trustee meeting on Thursday. Is that weird? Does anybody think I'm weird? I'm weird, huh? Um, but it is exciting because there's a lot of great things that God's doing among us. Uh, so let's give God thanks for the offering, shall we? Father, we are thankful for all your gifts, all your gifts of grace. Father, we pray over this offering right now that even as we continue to partner with you in mission and to seek your will, the direction you might lead us as a church, we give ourselves to you, God, fully. So may you take these gifts and multiply them for mission. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. This song that uh, we're going to sing is, uh, can be found in 534 in your hymnal, if you want to turn there. It's a song that um, means a lot to me because one of the very first uh, funeral services I was ever asked to lead had this song in it. And it was such a beautiful, heartwarming promise of God's grace, God's, God's confidence even in the face of death. So 534 in the hymnal if you want to follow along with us as we sing. Yeah. 
I'm going to read you 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 17. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible for the day, will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If which has been built on foundations survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burnt up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. The word of God, thanks be to God. Good job. Isn't that so, the words of that song just really a good, some good words, good meaningful words, um, a good encouragement. This morning we are continue, continuing uh, the sermon series, The Good Place, Honest Conversations About the Afterlife. And uh, this morning I'm going to be preaching on a passage that's uh, quite familiar um, to us. It begins with the Last Supper meal of Jesus, and it, and it reaches a, a point in the mill where Jesus talks about heaven a little bit. And uh, it, it's well-quoted verses. A lot of it's going to be familiar to us, but maybe with a new spin. Because the uh, title of the sermon, as you saw in the bulletin, is Do We Get Mansions in Heaven? So let's, let's start together. Chapter 13 Verses 1 through 5. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Hear the word of God. John chapter 13, 1 through 5. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. It must have been quite strange to sit around that last supper table and eat that last meal with Jesus before the cross. It must have been quite strange. Because on the, on the one hand, what a beautiful moment, right? Eating with Jesus, dining with the Savior face to face with God incarnate. But on the other hand, Jesus spends the entire meal speaking about his death. He's preparing his closest followers for what comes next after the cross. For life after Jesus no longer sits with them face to face. And those disciples hearing this for the first time, they must have been completely confused. I mean, these are men who took every step that Jesus took. They lived every single moment with the Savior by their side for at least the past three years. And after all that time, culminated in this meal, after all that time, they have come to fully believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They see Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus is their King. And the King is not supposed to wash somebody else's feet. Yet that's exactly how Jesus begins the meal. 
the Messiah is not supposed to come face to face with death. Except that's how Jesus says the meal will finish. Really, it must have been quite a strange conversation over that dinner table. And that's not even mentioning what happens with Judas Iscariot. Not only does Jesus speak of his death like it's something coming tomorrow, but he also looks at the the group gathered there at the table and blames one of them as the culprit. He looks in the eyes of each disciple gathered at the table and says gut-wrenching words, one of you will betray me. In fact, Jesus makes the whole scene quite theatrical. He kind of dramatizes it all a bit by taking a piece of bread and saying, whoever I give this dipped piece of bread to, that's who's going to betray me. Look at verse 21 of John chapter 13 with me. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit, and he declared, Very truly, I tell you, tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, Do quickly what you're going to do. Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. I mean, even after the big gesture Jesus makes by by dipping a piece of bread in the common cup and and handing it to Judas, the disciples are are still wildly confused. It's the first time Jesus is is talking like this. And surely Judas wouldn't betray Jesus. Surely Judas wouldn't betray Jesus to death. Not Jesus. This, This simply can't be the truth. But as Judas leaves the table, as Judas puts into motion the betrayal that that would send Jesus to the cross, that would lead Jesus to the grave, that's when Jesus starts to get very serious about death. Look at verse 31 of John chapter 13 with me. When he had gone out, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. In other words, now the time has come. Verse 32, If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Where I am going, you cannot come. At that last supper table, how hard did those words hit? I'm only with you a little while longer, Jesus says, and you can't come with me. Why? Why not? I mean, sitting around that table, the words, they they even hit us in the gut right here, right now. They don't really make sense. Why? Why not? I mean, if if Jesus is going to die, if he's done speaking in riddles and he's telling the plain truth, why would we not go with him? What is he talking about? In fact, Peter says says to Jesus, Jesus, I don't know what you're getting at, but I'm going to follow you to the grave. Look at verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? 
Jesus answered, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. He can't quite make sense of what Jesus is getting at. I want to follow you right now. His deepest desire is to be where Jesus is, to go where Jesus goes, to live where Jesus lives. It's not enough that Jesus tells Peter, one day you'll follow me. Peter wants to be with Jesus right here, right now. And we can almost feel the tension flooding that Last Supper room as all the disciples now look left and right at each other, passion to be with the Savior stirring deep inside, fear of being left alone, pounding in their chest, anxiety about what even comes next if Jesus is not with them. But Jesus raises his hand, lowers the emotions of the room, and he offers these well-quoted words from John 14 as encouragement. They're words that I have often read at many funerals. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. I want to read that one more time, except I want to read it from the KJV up here, the Church Family Bible. Can I do that? These family Bibles are such special things. My mom and dad have one about the same size. This is John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so... If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. Jesus says these words to comfort disciples afraid of life without Jesus. And friends, these are also some of the most taken out of context words in the entire Bible. If I were to ask the average person on the street to describe what they think heaven looks like, in fact, we did this in Sunday school earlier, I had the, the youth close their eyes and imagine heaven, what it looks like. If I was to ask the average person on the street what they think heaven looks like, you know, most people, they would, they would paint a picture of, of pearly gates, golden streets, rows and rows of mansions overlooking a sea of white clouds. You know, we hear it all the time in all kinds of places. I'm gonna get my mansion someday. I've heard that a time or two. Or even more frequently, I've heard people say, I'm gonna walk those streets of gold. We hear it all the time. It's a vision of, of great wealth in heaven, of never-ending comfort in a heavenly place, a place where all my deepest desires are found. And it's far from a true biblical vision of what heaven is all about. You know, I wanted to read that translation from the King James Version because it's a translation of the Bible that sits near to many of our childhood memories. You know, I already said my, my parents have their own King James Version Bible that's about that same size that my mom often brought out to read to me and my brothers as we were growing up. You know, I know how dear the King James Version of the Bible is to the journey of faith of, of many of us sitting in this room. 
But there's a major problem with how the King James Version translates these words from Jesus in John chapter 14, with how it uses that word mansions. It's not actually what the original Greek word in the Bible means. And it's led to an idea of heaven in our culture, a vision of heaven as a place of material blessings, a place where gold and mansions and priceless pearls are what matter the most. But, but really what Jesus is saying here, those ideas of gold and mansions and priceless pearls, they're far from what he's really getting at. In the original Greek word, it, it doesn't actually say anything about what kind of house Jesus is talking about. You know, in other words, it doesn't say anything about the house being large in the Greek. It doesn't say anything about the house being small. It doesn't say anything about it being an expensive house or a simple house. The word, in fact, says nothing about quality or size or expense of the father's house. So already the word mansions is a little bit stretched because when we think of mansions, we think of big, we think of expensive, we think of priceless possessions being inside. So what does the word really mean? Well, John 14, 23, same chapter, same conversation. Jesus uses the same word, chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. And make our home with them. That's what the word means. Make our home with them. It's the same word used in both places. It's a word about being with someone. A word about dwelling in a place with a family a word about our deepest desire for belonging. Let me give a practical, easy to understand example. Me, Katie, and Sybil, we live in the house next door, right? It's a wonderful house. The church has done a wonderful job maintaining that house for many years now. But without, without the people inside, it's just a house. It's just a house. Add the people, add the belonging, and it's a home. That's the difference. I am only truly at home when I am with my family. That's what the Greek word used there in John 14 is all about. It's about going home. It's about belonging in a place with a family. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places, Jesus says. In other words, in the heart of God our Father, there is plenty enough room for everyone to belong in the family. If it were not so, Jesus says, would I have told you I go to prepare a place for you? Go to prepare a place for you. What is Jesus talking about? It's the night before the cross. He's talking about the cross. He's talking about preparing a way for us to become part of the family of God, for us to be in the presence of God like never before on the night before the cross. That's the place he's going to prepare. Jesus is going to make a home for us. And that's what the disciples are so desperately concerned about when Jesus first spoke those words anyway. Here he is, he's telling them about his death. He's telling them about the cross where he will die. It's only a few short hours away. And what concerns the people around the table the most has nothing to do with mansions on a hill. What concerns them the most has nothing to do with gold paved streets or pearly gates. What concerns them the most has nothing to do with pleasure, comfort, or rest. What concerns them the most is this simple desire to be where Jesus is. 
And why? Why is that their main desire, their main concern? It's because they have walked hand in hand with Jesus and they've tasted and seen the gospel truth. If life does not have Jesus in it, it's not actually alive. It does not matter what I have or what I own or what I did or what I do. If I am far from Jesus, I am far from life itself. There is no life after death if we can't be with Jesus. And here's the gospel truth. As Jesus said those words to his disciples only the night before the cross, he didn't just tell them, you're going to have to figure out the way to get there. He gave them the way to be with God. Look at verse 3 with me of chapter 14. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. The gospel of Jesus Christ we preach, it is the only truth. And friends, it does not matter if we live in a mansion or in a shack. It does not matter if we're sitting on a throne or if we're nothing more than a doormat. In, in the, the sweet by and by, if I've got a mansion, that's good. If I don't, that's good. The one thing that matters is being where Jesus is. In fact, that's not just the one thing that matters. That's the only thing that matters. If we are not where Jesus is, there is no life. There is no life. See, that's what I want in heaven, to be where Jesus is, to be where Jesus is. And so this is why we give our lives to Christ, dear friends. It's not for the sake of some blessing. It's not for the sake of some heavenly ticket to punch. It's not for the sake of a mansion on a hill one day in the sweet by and by. No. The reason we give our lives fully to God in Jesus Christ is that when we are where Jesus is, when our lives are found in Christ, that is the only place we will ever be fulfilled. That's it. It's the only place we'll ever be fulfilled. He's the way, the truth, the life. And finding that life is so simple. In fact, Jesus turned to his own disciples and he said, you already know the way to the place I'm going. Believe in faith that Christ is the only way. There's no other way. There's no other pursuit worth it. The only truth, nothing I, I have or do is truth. It's Christ and Christ alone that is truth. And the life, if you don't have Christ in your life, you don't have life. You don't have life. And when we give it all over to God, that's when this promise of the Savior becomes our very own comes our very own. So my prayer for us today is that we might give it all to God. We might give it all to God and pursue being with Christ and Christ alone. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing one more song, a fun one, soon and very soon. But I want to invite you you know, it's so easy to get wrapped up into other pursuits in this life. I mean, I know it. I'm saying this as a preacher, right? 
It is easy to get wrapped up in pursuits of other things in life and forget that being in the presence of God is the main thing. It is the main thing. And so I just want to invite you as we sing this song, you know, every week the altar is open as a place of prayer. I'm here as a place to to process anything you need to process. Give your life to Christ if you have not done that already. Um, these These are times that we have. It's called an invitation to discipleship in our bulletin because it's a chance for us to respond to how God is stirring in our heart. So as we sing this last song, let's, let's respond to God fully. Let's stand together and sing soon and very soon. We'll sing it through twice. You gotta get our blood pumping too. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. so much rhythm. (laughs) Friends, as we go from this place, may we ask ourselves the honest question of what the deepest pursuit in our life is. What do we hope the most for in heaven? Friends, if it is not first and foremost to be in the presence of God, we've got a heart issue. May we go work through these things and pursue Christ and Christ alone because that's where we will find the fullness. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.